Hello and welcome to Pub and Restaurant Rebirth from Supersonic Inc. And that's me, Mark McSee. So I've been working in the industry for about 20 years with brands like Yosushi, Pret and many, many others. Today I want to take you through how to, when you've got a bit of downtime, get everyone's heads together and think about either defining or redefining your brand DNA. So what we have here then is the opening page. So if you want to get in touch with me, email is mark at supersonic.marketing and Instagram and Twitter is at supersonic underscore inc. So as I say, this is series one, module one. We're just going to try and put as much free information out there as we possibly can. And when I say we, I mean myself and all of my friends and colleagues across the brand and marketing part of the hospitality industry. So this is me and the companies that I work for, if you don't know me. So lastminute.com, Bartley Card, Yo Sushi, We7, which became Linkbox Music, Preta Monji, and then started an agency called We Are Spectacular before starting Supersonic Inc, where it's just me consulting and working with clients directly. So the name very quickly came from me doing this process with a guy called Robert Bean, who I'll talk about in a second. And Robert is a guru in this stuff. And he got my brand DNA to be Rocket Booster. And basically the thought was, if I'm added to any business, then I'll Rocket Boost whichever area I'm put into. So therefore, Supersonic, the name came out of this Rocket Booster thought. Also playing Sonic the Hedgehog far too much and listening to way too much Oasis. Some brands that you'll know and love and may even have worked for. So this is the brands that I've worked with over the years. So I'm sure you know many people that either love or have worked here. So uh, it shows the experience I've had over the last 20 years. Also, don't forget, there's a weekly podcast. There is a podcast series before this one that's going to come out in April and there's about 43 episodes and the cover looks slightly different and it's by uh, BDO who supported us in the first series majorly so do get listened to that go into iTunes and Spotify and uh, there's 43 episodes there of, of great free information also if you want to get in touch with me do it for the gram or eat sleeping tweeting repeating so in Instagram and Twitter I'm on at supersonic underscore inc so what I wanted to do was kick off talking about a great man and the great man is a guy called Robert Bean. So I was incredibly lucky when I was at lastminute.com that Robert became my brand consultant and I started to understand what brand meant. So the process that I'm going to go through is based on what Robert does for companies. Uh, it might not be as well, but um, it's there. And also Robert's got an amazing book called Winning in Your Own Way which is you know, well worth getting for about 14 quid on Amazon. So check that out, please go and get it. And it will really help you when you're wanting to refer to some notes, et cetera. So Robert's taught me this over the years. We've done it together as well to great effect. So Robert does it for his clients. I do it slightly differently for mine, but the guts of what I'm about to take you through is based on Robert's view of, of how it's done. So um, you're really getting some great free advice here. And thanks to Robert for offering up to be able to share this. So, you know, Beyonce, we ready? Right, we'll go. So the first thing is, what do you stand for? So there's a little bit of background here, and the background is just to get you into the mindset and focusing a bit on what brand DNA is all about. So from Robert's book, there are three parts to any brand. So there's the culture circle, there's a the products and services circle, and there is the reputation circle. Now, most companies are in this state where culture, products and services, and reputation are all sitting devoid of each other, or indeed they're flying through the air unaerodynamically because they're not aligned, or, and or, they're pulling in different directions. So it all means that there's inefficiencies going on, which is ultimately costing you money. What we want to do then is try and find through this process, the glimpse, the diamond in the rough, the thing that holds your culture, your products and services, and your reputation together. And once you have that, then it's about living it. Now, 
There is a little bit of wriggle room around the edges and life ain't perfect, as Robert always says. So it will never be exactly right. And also people are always the variable. So it's always changing in terms of people and culture and things like that. So when you're aligned, you'll be efficient, which means you'll be profitable. Therefore, ongoing alignment equals sustainable profitability, which ultimately equals shareholder value, which is what most people are there for and hoping for. But hopefully there's also a social value as well, where you're going to be given back because people really expect that from their businesses these days too. Now, this has always been a handy chart, which is a bit of a Jurassic Park brand DNA strand. But the aim of the game really is by the end of this, you should be able to, and all of your teams being aligned round the boardroom table, round the uh, staff canteen area, whatever it is, everyone should be singing off the same hymn sheet. So your brand name and the logo, your brand positioning, which is almost the last thing that we come to in this, but that's one of the most important things. Your core consumer, so who is that and what actually happens there. Core product, so thinking about what you are in the business of. The brand benefits, and most people say our people, right? They'll say our people are the best. I'm calling BS on that in most cases because they don't have more arms, they don't have more legs. And actually, it's probably quite disrespectful to other organizations as well who are working really hard. I doubt that many organizations, apart from the top 0.5%, the people are really the difference. The people should be almost that hygiene factor. What else have you got in your offering, in your concept? I'm not buying that it's your people. Everyone says it. Brand evidence. So why would I walk over hot coals to come to you? How would this stand up in court? Then your brand personality, describing the brand as a person. And then your tone of voice. So how would that person speak or that brand speak? And then your claim, you know, the biggest, the best, the fastest, the strongest, the freshest, the whatever, if you can manage that, if your brand is really sharp. And then what are we? So that comes down to your two words, summing up your brand positioning statement, really, where all the meaty goodness is into a couple of words. So where I like to start when I'm doing this is thinking about what's your story. So it's really good to start thinking about that. I have been in meetings where people actually say, oh, uh, there's no story. We were just told to make up some brands that made some money. So that's not ideal. And that means that you're bending it like Beckham for eight hours trying to make up stuff. And if it's born on lies and falsities, you'll get found out in the end. So the best thing you can do is truly look for some kind of authentic story. Was it the founder? Was it an opportunity? Was it a site? Was it a burger? Was it a mistake? You know, the innocent story, for example, is well told about the guys being down at the festival and, you know, having that, the two bins, selling fruit smoothies. And do you think we should give up our jobs? Yes or no. And the, the yes bin was more full than the no bin. So definitely worth looking at that. So storytelling, as I say, is the best marketing. If you look at any of the great brands, they've got a great story behind them and they use it time and time and time again daily. So again, getting that down is a really good idea and getting everyone agreed on it, educated on it, and so they can all rhyme it off. Then we talk about what is it. So I really like to do the, the granny or the granddad test. I don't mean to be ageist or sexist or any of these things. But good old super gran or my, my granny up, up the road, what I try to do is speak to the people in the room when we're doing the brand DNA and say, my gran's on the phone, she's a little bit short-tempered and not up for any BS, and she's asking me who I'm working with this week. And basically, I'll speak to her and say, right, I'm working with this bar or this restaurant, and they do this. Now, there's a couple of words I want in here. Everyone tries to make it a cute strap line. Everyone tries to make it really long and complicated and ethereal. You know, it needs to really live in reality. You know, when you're at a dinner party, when you meet someone new, I work for so-and-so and they do what? And it's without you feeling a little bit of sick coming up because what happens is, you know, I've been in a couple of sessions where it was something like, you know, our salads inspire a generation. And it's like, oh man, mate, really? So. What we need to do there is say, 
like what is it in reality and it's getting it down to basics and it might even do you a slight disservice but you want to get it right down so if you do word association costa coffee mcdonald's mcdonald's burgers all these types of things it really helps ground it so at the heart of it what are you really and there's people that will deny they're a bar there's people that deny that uh, they're a restaurant, they're an old day, but they want to be something else. And it's really hard to just say, look, if you're prepped, you know what, you're a really good or a posh sandwich shop. If you're Wagamama, you know, it's a Japanese ramen bar or it's a ramen bar, really, at its absolute heart. Um, I know it's bigger than that and there's, you know, the healthy and happiness and, you know, both the soul and all these things. But if it's something is a corner shop, it's a corner shop. So... You know, it's really thinking about that. What is it? And just getting it right down to the heart of it. And it will be so liberating once you realize what that is. So then we look at who's it for. So this is Desert Island Discs time. And what happens is I talk to people and say, I would like you to pick one type of customer who will profitably grow your business forever. And this is hard and it's meant to be hard because what happens is people then get out of it and they go, oh, 16 to 60. And it's like, that really doesn't help anyone. And it's a falsity. And also, you know, when people say, oh, we're open to everyone, we welcome everyone. It's like, well, you don't certain people. So let's have a look at that. If you're a hotel brand, you know, it isn't everyone that's tired. You know, it, there's even for the most accessible hotels in the world, there is a limit to which you'll target. It's not everyone that's got a head that wants to go to sleep. So it's really getting that down and saying there's a primary audience uh, and, and really nailing that and make sure you almost feel like you're not allowed any other because it gives you a get out. But then once you've nailed that, you can have a secondary and a tertiary audience. That's not a problem at all. But it really is about you picking one type of customer who will profitably build your business forever. And this will be liberating for you. It will really help you make some great decisions. And then we go into motivation. So why do they eat with you? Why do they drink with you? Now, what you tend to find is you keep asking, it's almost like the five whys. So if you try and get that book or you know find some details on that, you just keep asking why. So for example, you could say, well, people want to eat healthy. Well, why is that? Well, they want to be well and not die. All right. Well, anything else? Well, they want to be maybe a bit more trim and, and healthy and, and, and good looking. All right, well, why is that? Well, because they want to attract a great looking partner. All right, well, why is that? You know, and then it goes to procreation and all these things. So usually you're dealing in some kind of time or money or, you know, getting together racial relationships, status, you know, all these types of things. So I would take some time and, and get that book, The Five Whys, and really think about every single strand of why they will eat with you or they will drink with you, lunch with you, dinner with you, breakfast with you, really flush out those whys. And then what you want to do is get people to vote on the best ones or the ones that resonate the most in terms of motivations. So, you know, really, really think about that. Um, just, I'm going to go back actually just to the uh, customer for a sec. A couple of things here as well to, to, to mop up. One is um, try and think about the demographics of that person uh, and I know it seems old-fashioned a lot of the time and all the rest of it and obviously gender neutrality and all these things but just try your best to to nail that because it really helps when you're looking at communications and media planning on how you're going to actually target someone the other thing to think about is psychographics so although it, you might span a wide range of ages you know try and get down to one age if you can but you know if you think you span then is there something that's holding that together you know is it people who expect more is it people that want performance or status or quality or an experience or you know what's it going to be so sorry i had to go back to that so yeah you'll get your your five whys so do all that and do it as a bit of a mind map good idea to kind of write whatever the question is in the middle why would they eat dinner with us and then start mind mapping out on, on all the branches. Then what you want to do is look at what makes you so special. So this is you up against your competitors. Now, what you want to do here is probably take three or four competitors. So either named brands or maybe slight sectors that are a bit of a pain in the butt for you. 
um, a bit of a pain in the side. So they're literally stealing your lunch or dinner money. So for example, if you were prep, you might have said Leon and Eat and you know a few others. Or what you could do with Pret is say, well, actually, there's independent sandwich shops, there's chain sandwich shops, there's coffee shops, and there's going to many supermarkets like Boots and Sainsbury's and their meal deals and all that. So it's really up to you. Um, but what you want to do is pretend that you work for them, pretend you're the CEO, uh, the competitors, and really, really, really stick it to yourself. Really stick it to yourself in terms of all the things that you want to get out. So usually what you want to do is get a group of maybe eight to 10 people doing this exercise. And what you would want to do is have a little bit of a face off, a bit of pantomime, where you would want to look at having these people in pairs maybe for four groups where you absolutely stick it to yourself. And then once you've got all the lists of why they are better than you, you have the fight back where you start putting up the reasons why you're better. And it would be really neat if you had maybe three or four really strong USPs. Don't overreach. It's okay if you don't have any, then you know there's a job to do. And also it's okay if you have some stretch ones that you're going to work towards, because that's going to help the alignment as well. So that's that part. Then you want to think about your personality. So know who you are and who you're not. So with that, there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can get a bunch of magazines and ask everyone to take one image within the magazine that resonates with them to describe the personality of the brand as if it was a person. So that, that's a good way to do it. And you want to try and get it down to maybe four words that, that sort of mean something through the group. There's another thing called Brand Deck, and it's available online and Kickstarter. And it's a little deck of cards with opposing words on it. And again, you can play that game with that, give the cards out equally, and then everyone chooses the words that resonate the strongest with them. And then you work this down into these four words that become your personality. Now, a big tip from me and Robert as well is, it would be great if the values are also your personality. Now, what we come across so much as we go into business, uh, or go into businesses, and what happens is, they've, you know, you've got the HR team, no disrespect to them at all, but they've got a set of values which spells chicken or something, because you're a chicken restaurant, and then your values are something completely different. This whole game is about alignment. So if you can get everything aligned, it's a really great thing. So it's what to kind of look at is saying, well, how can we revisit or harmonize with the values that we have um, or indeed scrap them and then look at that new way forward now what you do from here is you've got your main words that are your personality and your brand values or behaviors indeed depending on what your language is but then what you want to do is some synonym work so you'll do some synonym work to say well if we're energetic then we are positive and we are bold or something like that or vibrant so you know, start doing that work as well. So you, everyone knows that by energetic, that's what you mean. And if you are simple, it's not about being dumb. It's about you being straightforward and transparent and all these things. So definitely a great way to go. And then it's coming to near the end of this where you're bringing it all together. And I talk about the Cluedo moment. So Professor Plum in the library with the whatever. So you're bringing the whole thing together. Now what you'd have is probably some flip charts up with all the work that you've done already and then all the clues are on there don't deviate from there because all the answers are on those sheets and then you basically want to bring it together into a positioning statement so I'll talk to you about that in a wee sec but the main thing usually is that it's the their motivation the customer's motivation crossed with what you do best so for example if you're customers are experienced seekers in some way and what you do best is give this amazing you know all year round experience in some way that is more than just a meal then that's where that would cross over and it's about you explaining that now i've got a couple of old examples that are out of sector and they'll probably be out of date by now as well um but there's work that i did with robert when, when i was a kid back at lastminute.com so what we've got here is lastminute.com's positioning statement. So lastminute.com were a leisure site for all these things to do at the last minute. And you know a lot of people know them for holidays, but it was much more than that. 
So we've got lastminute.com's role in life is to help people make the most of their free time with new, creative and unexpected ideas every single day. And I think at one point we added without hurting the planet as well, uh, they shouldn't cross the earth, ho ho in that kind of pun way, uh, because there was a big carbon neutral thing going on at the time as well. And then another example of a sector, it was part of lastminute.com was Holiday Autos, which was an amazing car hire company that we had. So Holiday Autos' role in life is to campaign tirelessly, so almost a tire pun in there, for a hassle-free, better informed car hire service from booking to drop off. Now, I understand that it's quite hard for you to maybe understand how it all plugs together, but I've got some notes here on a few slides which says about how you can write a brand statement. It's a more basic way of doing it, but then I think working with maybe someone like myself or Robert, this is where it's a good idea because we can help guide you through how to sort of do it properly, but this is quite a good way for you at least to make a start on it. So the task I would put to you is, for you to write a brand positioning statement for your brand. Don't worry, it's not too scary. I'll, you know, I'll look at what you've got as well, or you've all done collectively, even if people want to send me it, and I can have a wee check, there's no problem. But you want to bring it all together in terms of the best one. So from here, what I think you should do is look at some tips for creating the positioning statement. So when you're writing and evaluating your positioning statement, there's a little checklist here. So try and keep it brief, you know, no more than a couple of sentences if you can, although I'm going to go back on that by showing you some longer examples in a second. Make it as unique and memorable as possible. It's got to be true to your business core values, and it includes a credible promise of what the brand delivers to consumers. So Robert always talks about a brand being a promise delivered, and that should keep you honest when you're doing this. It also communicates how your business is different from the competition and it's clear enough for use as a guideline to evaluate whether or not business decisions align with the brand. So when you write this positioning statement, when you've got this DNA, when you've got your values, that should be the area that keeps you honest. So it should be this Bible that everyone turns to from innovation to menu decisions to some who you hire to what's going on in terms of reward and recognition, what the design of your, your restaurant looks like, your pub, you know, absolutely everything, your naming conventions, everything. So then the positioning statement shouldn't be stagnant, you know, so make sure your statement provides room for growth as your business matures and products change. So with, for example, any, you know, natural disasters that have been going on or things like uh, changing consumer moods, you know, if you're a meat restaurant, everyone goes vegan, make sure that you've got enough diversification in your portfolio, diversification in what you do, and also opportunities for you to grow wider than just being that one trick pony. So a guide on writing brand positioning statements. So positioning statements are used to describe how products or service fill a need for your target market or your persona. They're a must have for any positioning strategy and create a clear vision for your brand's positioning. Unlike a mission statement or a vision statement, a positioning statement is not a public facing tagline. At its core, it's a statement of how you want your brand to be perceived. This is very important. A lot of people get really cute and strappy with strap lines. Um, they also talk about, you know, the mission and it's a positioning and there's a vision. And so I'll come on to that in a sec, but they're very, very different things. So as a basic template for you to start, this could be quite a good idea. So for, you know, whatever it is, aspirational young professionals who really would like a good night out, you know, for example, your pub's name provides the main benefit that differentiates you from your competitors. And it has to be really true, that one, because reason why target market should believe your differentiation statement. So go through that again. So for whatever your target market is, the number one core audience that you've got, who target their market need, you, your brand name, provides main benefit that differentiates your offering from competitors because... And then you put in the reason why the target market should believe your differentiation statement. So here's a couple of examples. They'll be in here for you. I won't read them a million times, but this was from the internet. I don't think it's Coca-Cola's real one, but it's 
Coca-Cola is done in this style, which should give you a clue on how you could fill in the blanks when you go through it. So for individuals looking for high quality beverages, Coca-Cola offers a wide range of the most refreshing options. Each creates a positive experience for customers when they enjoy a Coca-Cola brand drink. Unlike other beverage options, Coca-Cola products inspire happiness and make a positive difference in customers' lives. And the brand is intensely focused on the needs of consumers and customers. So that's that one. Amazon's position and statement. For consumers who want to purchase a wide range of products online with quick delivery, Amazon provides a one-stop online shopping site. Amazon sets itself apart from other online retailers with its customer obsession, passion for innovation, and commitment to operational excellence. Okay. Nike or Nike or Nike, whichever you say. For athletes in need of high quality, fashionable athletic wear, Nike provides customers with top performing sports apparel and shoes made from the highest quality materials. Its products are the most advanced in the athletic apparel industry because of Nike's commitment to innovation and investment in the latest technologies. Okay. Apple, so Apple's position and statement. For individuals who want the best personal customer, sorry, who want the best personal computer or mobile device, Apple leads the technology industry with the most innovative products. Apple emphasizes technological research and advancement and takes an innovative approach to business best practices. It considers the impact of our products and processes have on its customers and the planet. So that's a very topical one at the end there. McDonald's, so for individuals looking for a quick service restaurant with an exceptional customer experience, McDonald's is a leader in the fast food industry with its friendly service and consistency across thousands of convenient locations. McDonald's dedication to improving operations and customer satisfaction sets it apart from other fast food restaurants. So then once you've done that, you want to think about how to sum up all your positioning statement into two words. So some examples from before, but with Honda, Robert worked on this massively. It was the power of dreams was the strap line, but the two word DNA was spirited visioneers. So it was all about the spirit of Mr. Honda and this vision engineering that then would see them go from bicycles, making bicycles with lawnmower engines attached, then to winning the Isle of Man TT and now to robots and all sorts of space technology. Lastminute.com with the statement that you saw earlier, we got to fearless fun mongers. So basically we sold fun fearlessly. So that was really strong for us. It's something you wouldn't probably tell people, you wouldn't put it on a poster. It was just, it held us together as a bit of a gang. So we all sold fun fearlessly, which we quite like. And then at Holiday Autos, it was all about car hire crusading. So it was crusading for better, fairer, better informed car hire. And that was against Hertz, Avis, and all these other ones. So they were trying to be the real challengers there and, and still are today, I think. So a couple of wee things just to tidy up as we get to the end here, thinking about the vision statement and the mission statement. So just to clear this up, this was from Lumen, uh, which is a great resource online when you put in vision and mission statement difference, I think it was. So it really comes up with some great stuff. So a vision statement is a statement of an organization's overarching aspirations of what it hopes to achieve or become. Here are some examples. So Disney, to make people happy. Ikea to create a better everyday life for the many people. BBC to be the most creative organization in the world. Avon to be the company that best understands and satisfies, satisfies the product, service and self-fulfillment needs of women globally. I'm sure that's changed for the better. Uh, Sony Corporation to be a company that inspires and fulfills your curiosity and you'll be able to, to read the rest. But Basically, it's this overarching statement that's almost never ending. So it's something you'll always be chasing. Now, 
your mission and vision are often confused and many companies just use the terms willy-nilly and interchangeably. However, they definitely have a different purpose and the vision statement describes where the organization wants to be in the future. The mission statement then says how you're going to get there. What do they need to do? So some examples here are Adidas or Adidas, depending on what you say. We strive to be the global leader in the sporting goods industry with brands built on the passion for sports and a sporting lifestyle. Amazon, we seek to be the Earth's most customer-centric company for four primary customer sets. Brilliant. Google, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Honest Tea, to create and promote great tasting, truly healthy organic beverages. JetBlue, to provide superior service in every aspect of our customers' air travel experience. New York Times, to enhance society by creating, collecting, and distributing high quality news and information. So hopefully you can get that, you know, visions where you're always striving to get to and striving to be. Mission is how the heck you're going to get there and what you're going to do every day to make sure that's going to happen. Also at this stage, you might be re-looking at your company name or indeed you might not have a name for your company or your concept. So with all that information, like Rocket Booster getting to Supersonic, that should really help you figure that out. And indeed, is your name right in the first place? Then you might want to look at a strap line. So, you know, there's some great examples up here. Makeup of makeup artists and believe in better and all these different things. So uh, finger licking good, maybe not at the moment. But anyway, have a wee look at that and see what you think. And it's back to those three circles. So once you've got all this written down, then go back to the culture, the products and services, and the reputation. How that's going to hold things together and then how eventually you're going to bring that together. Obviously then filling out this brand DNA strand, do it this way, do it as a pint, do it as a big sausage, it really doesn't matter but make sure this gets around your people and you engage them in it so that they all know what this means. Then about a Pink Floyd, you want to basically shine this all over your company. So shining it over your culture, shining it over your products and services and shine it over your reputation. And you might need to make big decisions here. Deadwood that's in the organization, culture not going the right way, stuff that you do that you really shouldn't be, you know, should you be selling chips or whatever just because it makes you money or burgers? Is that really what your brand's about? Um, the service, you know, is it an opportunity that you might need to go online or be a little bit more digital? And then what people think of you, you know, it might actually be that people don't think that much of you at all, but you should hopefully have a really good sense of that from, you know, Google reviews and, and TripAdvisor reviews and feedback and, you know, companies like Feed It Back, for example, um, who are working in the, the pub and restaurant industry. Um, and, you know, Facebook, Google, and, and TripAdvisor reviews as well. There's no excuse for you not knowing what people think of you, really. As I say, you probably want to then take that out into your people and get intellectual buy-in, you know, head, heart, and hands, behavioral changes, and then emotional buy-in that they're proud to be there. And then shine the brand lens over all of your products and services. Uh, you know, really shine that back into your organization. And then what you want to do is look at for reputation, once you've got your key messaging sorted to then help change perception of your reputation if you need to, then you want to spray it amongst your paid, owned and earned media. I would argue in this slide that social actually splits into paid, owned and earned as well. But have a look at that and really sort of rinse that. Make sure that you're just consistently consistent across everything that's free in terms of your, the channels that you own stuff that you're paying for, you know, adverts, sponsorships, whatever, and your PR and, and word of mouth, make sure that's all aligned. And then what you want to do is have tasks lists. So what do you do to need, need to do to change the culture? What do you need to do to change the product and services? And what do you need to do to change the reputation? And as you know, some cool stuff, uh, you know, Virgin are always great at these things. So, you know, when you're hiring someone, you know, thinking about your induction packs, et cetera, I believe you used to send out Kit Kats and a cup of tea and a DVD back in the day for people to watch to, to get to know the company. So really nice things like that. Having really on brand incentives like Registry Barbecue, for example, where when your chefs are doing a really good job 
and you know they're outperforming their, their peers and colleagues they get a reward to go to you know austin to do barbecue uh, you know cook-offs or your know, tours or whatever um and then take it out to the people as well or take it out to your people you know can you imagine next year having you know a music festival for your brand whether it's for customers or whether it's for your teams and i know there's a lot of people do it you know peach do it really well peach pubs for example uh innocent did it for a long time so again it's really thinking about those lateral things that can get people engaged in the brand so i would say then this is your checklist so really what you want to do is really starting at your story which is below the line here so get your story straight Think about what it is in that one liner. Get your target customer sorted, but truly your target customer. Get your motivations, you know, the best motivations sorted. USPs, around about four that are really, really true with good evidence behind them. Get your values nailed, which also should be your personality. Write that role statement and do please send it to me and I'll, I'll have a look at it uh, if that's helpful. And then there's your brand DNA. And then if you go up to the top, once you get that figured out, you can look up and you can look at your purpose, which we haven't really covered, but you know, is there a higher purpose to what you do? And then your vision and your mission. So with purpose, you know, looking to brands that are purposeful rather than purpose washing, which I know Mark Ritson goes on about. But if you look at the ones like Tom Shoes and Patagonia and people like that, I mean, they truly are purpose driven brands. If you're not a purpose-driven brand, then don't force it because you're just going to look disingenuous. So really think about that. So definitely try and get your hands on Robert's book. Robert's also got a podcast series, uh, so check that out as well. Some really good stuff on there, the Shum and an SES guy and all different things. So uh, talking about branding and how important it is. So Winning in Your Own Way by Robert Bean is on uh, Amazon. So definitely check that out and, and buy that and get a flick through. It's a real easy read. So have a look. Um, and then that's me. So hopefully that's been really, really helpful to you. And it's the start of sharing some free information. And if you want to get in touch with me, you know, thanks so much. But any questions, any queries, any thoughts at all, you know, please get back to me on any of my social channels. So Mark McCulloch, Mark McSee, on LinkedIn at Supersonic underscore Inc on uh, Twitter and Instagram, Supersonic Inc on Facebook, and then my email is mark at supersonic.marketing. So thanks so much for listening. Please do take it easy out there and please share this with as many people as you can. And I really hope that it's brought you enough value that will really help your brand be reborn and boom. <laughs>